Are you recording? Okay, we're being recorded. All right. All right. Uh, thanks again for inviting me uh, to give a talk here. Um, so let me start. Uh, so as you can see, the title of the talk is Jenks Algebra as a Price Say Limit. And um, let me start by uh, just saying a few words about the classification program of CSR algebras. Um, because uh, Jiangsu algebra um, shows up there. And I, I, I don't know how much pe uh, people are familiar with the classification here, um, but I'm not gonna assume so much. Uh, and actually I'm not gonna use anything there. I just wanted to uh, basically um, make a point that Jiangsu algebra is quite important, that's it. So uh, the classification program of CSR algebra started uh, uh, well, uh, the first result goes back to 1960, uh, where Glim classified the class of all uh, UHF algebras by, super, by supernatural numbers or equivalently by subgroups of Q. Um, and in 1972, Bratchett-Lee classified AF algebras uh, using so-called Bratchett-Lee diagrams. By the way, I'm going to go a little bit faster because as I said, I thought the talk is going to be hour and a half, but it's uh, it's apparently one hour. So I'm gonna just, I probably have too many slides. Um, but uh, uh, the classification basically officially started uh, in uh, 1976 where um, George Eliot, building on work, uh, works of uh, Glim and Bratelli, classified uh, nuclear, uh, sorry, uh, classified AF algebras. Um, so he proved that uh, two separable unital AF algebras, A and B, e, are isomorphic if and only if they have the same K0 group. So you have the, this is a uh, partially ordered Abelian group with uh, uh, an ordered unit, ordered unit. Um, so <clears throat> uh, in 1989, Elliot conjectured that the class of all separable nuclear C star algebras could be classified using invariance based on K theory. And um, these invariants are called Elliot invariants and they're usually denoted by this um, E double L A for C star algebra A. Uh, so in order to classify more classes of C star algebras, this invariant had to be uh, expanded. Uh, and um, now uh, after, um, I guess many years, the invariant is now fixed to be, uh, basically you have the K0 group and K1 group and the uh, tracial state is a showcase implex. And then you have this uh, pairing map which is a map that pairs the uh, states, uh, uh, the space of tertial states with the state space of the uh, K0 group. Uh, but as I said, uh, they're not important in my talk, uh, but uh, certain C star algebras uh, play very important central roles in Elliott's classification program. Um, that these are, uh, usually the UHF algebras of infinite type, the Kunz algebras, O2 and O infinity, and the Jiangsu algebra. Um, these algebras, they all have a very crucial property in common, and they're all strongly self-absorbing. Um, and uh, all the classification results that are uh, given today, uh, probably after the, the first few classification results. Uh, they're all for nuclear C star algebras that tensorily absorb uh, strongly self-absorbing C star algebras. For, uh, that means those uh, C star algebras that uh, A tensor D is um, isomorphic to A, where D is one of the uh, these C star algebras mentioned here with side O2 or infinity or the Jiangsu algebra. And uh, a C star algebra A with this property is called D stable. Uh, so the, the classification results are basically of this form that uh, if T 
two C star algebras A and B are. Uh, they have the same Elliott invariant, but it's basically if and only if, if and only if uh, they're isomorphic modular tensor in with a strongly self-absorbing C star algebra. So there are uh, many results. I'm not going to mention the results. The results about the classifying of purely infinite um, nuclear C star algebras by uh, Kishberg and um, Phillips and so on. Um, but uh, let me just uh, define what I mean by strongly self-absorbing C star algebra. Um, uh, before defining it, we need this um, basically very elementary definition that two um, homomorphisms phi zero and phi one from A to B uh, between unital separable C star algebras A and B are approximately unitarily equivalent if there's a sequence of unitaries UN in B such that if you conjugate phi one with U N, you basically approach phi zero. So they are approximately unitarily um, the same. This for every A in A. All right, uh, now a C star algebra call, is called self-absorbing if it has this property. It, uh, it is isomorphic to the tensor product of uh, A with itself. And uh, if they're not nuclear, we really care about the minimal tensor product. Now the definition of the strongly self-absorbing, which uh, existed before this uh, two and, uh, 2005, but it was basically the officially defined uh, by uh, Toms and Winter um, in 2005. Uh, I think the name of the paper is uh, strongly self-absorbing C-star algebras. Um, so it's, uh, suppose these are uh, separable unital C-star algebra, D is strongly self-absorbing if, first of all, D is not the algebra of all complex numbers. And there is an isomorphism. So D is isomorphic to the D tensor D, but this isomorphism, there's an isomorphism with a special property that this isomorphism is approximately unitarily equivalent to the first factor embedding, meaning uh, the first factor embedding is, an, uh, is the embedding from D to D tensor D, which sends A to A tensor one. Could also have the second factor embedding here instead of first factor embedding. Uh, you get this equivalent definition. This one sends A to one tensor A. And um, so it's important that uh, the C star algebra D is unital so that you have these um, first and second factor embeddings. All right, as I mentioned, strongly self-absorbing C-star algebras uh, play a very important role in classification program. Uh, uh, in particular, uh, they are automatically simple nuclear and they're either purely infinite or stably finite with at most one tracial state. And uh, among these strongly self-absorbing C-star algebra, Jenks algebra, really stands out in the classification program. And uh, really the pinnacle of the, the classification program is this following theorem, which is the work of many uh, authors over you know, many years, uh, this result was obtained. Uh, so if you have two, um, if A and B are separable, simple, unital, and nuclear C star algebras satisfy UCT, um, this is not really important for my talk, what UCT is, beneficial, uh, universal coefficient theorem. Um, then uh, they have the same Elliott invariant if and only if they are isomorphic uh, up to tensoring with the Jiangsu algebra. So I, I, I don't know if I mentioned, but the, this Z is the Jiangsu algebra. It's usually denoted by Z. 
so this uh, this is uh, really stronger than uh, previous results because the class of um, so you could basically say that uh, A is uh, isomorphic. Oh, sorry. Uh, is isomorphic to B if A and B were uh, Z stable. And uh, the class of uh, Z stable um, C star algebra is the largest class among the uh, class of uh, D stable where D is a strongly self absorbing C star algebra. So this is really a um, quite a satisfying theorem. I mean, the only non satisfying part is this UCT, which uh, nobody knows um, if it's necessary. It's uh, conjectured that all these C star algebra sets by UCT. So this condition could be redundant. Uh, but otherwise, this is a very satisfying theorem um, for classification. Uh, so let's uh, start uh, talking about Jiangsu algebra. So it was introduced in 1999 by Jiang and Su. It's a simple, separable, unital, infinite dimensional, and projectionless C star algebra. But for projectionless, I mean the only projections are zero and unit, uh, which has the same Elliott invariant as C. So you cannot even distinguish this uh, Z using uh, Elliott invariance from, from C. And yet it is uh, infinite dimensional. Uh, so let me just give you an idea of how uh, the at least the building blocks of this look like, of Z look like. Um, so I'm going to use MN to denote the C star algebra of all complex N by N matrices with unit A, uh, one N. And you can define for any positive integers P and Q, a dimension drop algebra Z P Q, which is defined as uh, the following, that it consists of all set of a set of all uh, functions f from uh, unit in the closed unit interval into uh, mp times q, mpq, uh, such that f of zero belongs uh, to mp tensor one q, and f of one is f of one belongs to one p tensor mq. Uh, so these are called uh, dimension drop algebras, and they're called prime if P and Q are co-prime numbers. And it, it's not that difficult to check that a dimension drop algebra is projectionless if and only if it is prime. Now, what Jang and Su did in their original paper, they showed that there's a sequence of prime dimension drop algebras with uh, the sequence is with unital embeddings whose inductive limit is simple and monotracial. So you have the sequence Z, P1, Q1, Z, P2, Q2. These are all um, dimension drop algebras. And the limit of uh, first, uh, the limit is a C star algebra such that it is um, simple and monotracial. It has a unique trace. Now, a priori, it's not clear what such an algebra is unique. Uh, but what they did, they showed that such an inductive limit is unique. Uh, basically, um, these two properties of being unique and monotracial characterizes um, any limit of a sequence of prime dimension, prime dimension drop algebras. And they, they use the, the classification result that they prove in their paper. Um, and uh, it is, uh, it's not that easy really to, use, to show this prove, uh, uniqueness. You need some KK theory and so on. Um, but yeah, um, so they already proved that this is a unique and they called it Z. 
They also, in the same paper, even before strongly self-absorbing, uh, the notion of strongly self-absorbing was defined, they proved that Z is strongly self-absorbing. Uh, so they realized that, that really this is an important um, notion and uh, they really, uh, it's, a, it's quite a um, nice paper. Uh, it's quite impressive. So yeah, so they proved that Z is strongly self-absorbing already in their original paper. Uh, however, the proof uses heavy machinery from classification theory and they use KK theory. And um, for someone who's not an expert in classification theory, uh, the proof is uh, quite involved. And uh, like myself, I, I don't understand KK theory much and uh, I basically could not understand their proof. Uh, so it was, sort of desirable to um, have a proof that uh, is not so heavily involved uh, with um, classification tools. And that, that in their proof, they use these uh, few main ingredients. And I'm just going to mention um, these ingredients. Uh, if the first, um, definition and the fact that they need is to show that um, Z has approximately inner half flip. So it's C star algebra C, a unital separable C star algebra D um, is or has approximately inner half flip if the first and the second factor embeddings from D to D tensor D are approximately unitarily equivalent. That means basically uh, if you give me an epsilon and for every A in D, uh, I can always find a unitary um, in, in D, tensor D, such that um, conjugating with this unitary sends A tensor D to um, one tensor, a, sorry, a tensor one to one tensor a, uh, approximately. So this is what it means uh, for D to be, to have approximately in your half lift. And along the way of proving that Z is strongly self-absorbing, they basically, show that, or actually they need all these results that Z is, Z has approximately in a half flip, every unital endomorphism from Z or unital endomorphism of Z is approximately inner, and that there is a unital homomorphism phi from Z tensor Z into Z. Uh, and once you give uh, these three ingredients, then it is not that difficult to show that Z is um, strongly self-absorbing from these three. Now, in order to prove these three, the proof of this first one, it's, uh, it's quite nice, uh, but it does not use any, it's a direct proof. It does not use any classification result. However, the two and three, uh, they use, uh, tools from classification theory, such as KK theory. And um, again, um, it would be, as I said, it would be nice to have a proof of uh, the fact that that is strongly self-absorbing without uh, using KK theory. So in my proof, actually, I'm going to give you a uh, sort of an idea of uh, proving that Z is strongly self-absorbing, but I'm going to assume this, uh, the first one, and as I said, the uh, proof of this one is direct. And um, so I haven't committed a big crime here because uh, um, I'm not using any um, KK theory here. Uh, but uh, Can I, I just don't... ask um, about whether it has an approximately inner flip? Yeah, yes. And yeah. Is, that, is it possible to have approximately inner half flip but not approximately inner flip? Flip on the tensor uh, product? Oh, you talked about approximately inner flip. Uh, I don't know if it has approximately inner flip. Uh, I don't think it does. Um, 
Um, yeah, I don't think it does. I'm not quite sure. But all the strongly self-absorbing C star algebras, they do have approximately in a half flip. And I'm, I'm not sure exactly which ones have approximately in your flip. The, the probably the, the well, the, the infinite dimensional UHF algebras, in, sorry, UHF algebras of infinite type, they are uh, strongly self absorbing. They do have uh, both approximately in a half flip, well, uh, and they have approximately in a flip. So, uh, they, um, but the others, I'm not sure if they do. I don't think they do have approximately in your flip. All right, um, yeah, so the motivation for uh, my proof of the fact that Z is strongly self-absorbing comes from the following two papers uh, the, the, that they proved that Z is a Fricet limit. Uh, the two papers are the first one is uh, by Eagle, Farah, Hart, uh, Kades, uh, Kalashnik, and uh, Lupini. And then the second paper is uh, Masumoto's uh, paper and um, in both papers they basically prove this fact um, and what they show is that if you consider the category or the class whose objects are prime dimension drop algebras with fixed faithful traces so you're you have a class and the objects of your category or class are pq and with a faith uh, with a faithful trace and the morphisms are uh, that P prime prime and tau prime, they're trace preserving maps. So if you consider a class where the objects are objects and arrows are like this, then this class has joint embedding property, the near amalgamation property, and it is, uh, it's separable enough, uh, whatever that means. Um, you basically need to show that uh, uh, approximate, up to some approximation, you have only countably many arrows between uh, any two objects. That would basically mean uh, it is uh, separable. Um, so any class with these three properties is called a Fricet class. And what is important about them is that they are, um, they have a unique Fricet limit. It's a, it's a generic object that exists and it has this universality properties and universality and homogeneity properties. So all the Fricet classes, they have uh, a so-called, basically the most complicated object there is called Fricet limit and it's unique. Uh, and then, uh, after um, showing that there must be a price limit in this class, then they use some classification results to show that uh, um, unique price limit has to be Z. Like for example, in, in uh, so I think they use basic, they basically show that this price limit has to be simple and monotracial. And then they use the uh, cl classification of Jenga and Sue themselves to, to show that then it has to be Z. All right, um, so here's the main theorem that um, I proved. And uh, this basically roughly speaking, this is not a precise statement of the theorem, but what I uh, roughly showed that is that if you suppose K is a category of unital separable C star algebras and unital star homomorphisms, which is sufficiently closed under tensor products. Uh, what I mean by sufficiently, I'll try to uh, make it clear later on. Then if K has a price limit D and D has approximately in a half flip. So you have a category K and it has a price limit D with approximately in a half flip, then D uh, is strongly self-absorbing. Now you can apply this theorem to the category that uh, was defined here uh, in the, the same category. And uh, you need to, that category is not closed under uh, tensor product at all, 
but then you could uh, make, make, make a bigger category, uh, which is closed sufficiently under tensor product. And basically with some few tricks, you can show that that would imply, this theorem would imply that that is strongly self-absorbing. Um, uh, when I said it's not closed under uh, tensor product, uh, it's not easy to show that, it's not difficult to show that uh, if you have two um, prime dimensional, prime dimension drop C style algebras, they, the tensor product is not a prime dimension drop C style algebra. So, um, but you want to include these kind of objects in your category and you want to uh, get this result. Um, so I talked about uh, Freise limits and Freise categories, um, but what I really need is notion of Freise sequence. So in the following, suppose K is a category of separable C star algebras and star homomorphisms. Uh, this definition is basically due to Vyslav Kubish. Uh, the, Freise, the, the notion of Freise limit and Freise sequence they existed uh, in a long time ago, uh, since uh, the Freise, like I think in the 60s, uh, he, he proved that these Freise categories have Freise limits. But this definition and this categorical, uh, category theoretical approach to Freise limits is due to Vyslav Kubish. Uh, maybe I should have mentioned his name. So this definition is, uh, and, I, and I really, find this categorical, category theoretical um, approach to Freise theory uh, much easier than model theoretic approach. Um, it's much neater. Uh, so a K sequence, that means a sequence in the category K, where the objects are, uh, um, the Ns are objects of K and phi and Ms are, uh, morphisms, um, and uh, this is really the sequence of D1, D2, so phi 1, 2, and so on. You have Dn, Dm, and this is phi and m. These are the connecting maps, and they are the star homomorphisms. So this, a sequence like this is called a Freise sequence if it has the following two properties. Uh, first of all, it's, it's co-final. So if you give me any object in the category, let's say A, I can always find N and a K-morphism into one of them. So the sequence is co-final in the category. And the second property is this absorption property that if you give me an epsilon, a natural number n, and a finite subset f of dn, so I have f here, and you give me a k-morphism gamma from dn to b, I can find eta and m large enough so that this diagram commutes. Uh, it commutes up to epsilon on f. So meaning if you take an element uh, a in f and you go uh, from here and then here, the same as here up to epsilon, which is, uh, I denote it like this. So this is the, uh, these two properties, they define um, uh, price sequences. Does and, the, in the first property, does it have to be an embedding? It's it just a star homomorphism. Could it be the zero map or? Uh, yes, if it's a zero map, then you, uh, well, my categories are going to be unitol. If, if you allow zero maps, then your price sequence could be just zeros. Uh, yeah. So it's not interesting. Uh, so the price limit would give, be basically zero. So the interesting part is uh, when you allow star homomorphisms to be uh, unital or somehow non, uh, basically the K morphisms, you could allow some um, basic restrictions on uh, K morphisms. And the most typical one is uh, for them to be embedding or unital. And uh, in those cases, you get something non-trivial. 
So yeah, if you allow uh, zero to be part of your uh, K morphisms, then you get nothing. Yeah, the zero sequence would be basically your price sequence. So yeah, maybe it's, it's actually good to uh, assume these are um, unital star embeddings. That would be okay. Yeah. Um, it's not that difficult uh, to show that a Fricé sequence of K, uh, Fricé sequences. So um, you might have more than one, uh, of course, one, uh, one sequence, but all the Fricé sequences have isomorphic limits. So the limit is unique. And the, the, the proof of this, as I said, is uh, just uh, approximate intertwining arguments. Suppose you have two Fricé sequences, Pns and Ens, and you can basically build this back and forth between these two. And if T and E are the respective limits, uh, first using the fact that this sequence, the one below is um, a price sequence uh, and using the cofinality property, I can find this first map because it's cofinal, therefore D and one Go somewhere. If and uh, let's say n one is one, it goes somewhere, and uh, then I can use the fact that this one is a price sequence, and I can find this map. But in order to do that, I should have first um, fixed finite sets here. So I said f one, f two, the finite subset here, and f uh, f three and so on, such that uh, they are increasing and the union is dense in D. And similarly, fix G1, G2 finite subsets of E MIs, such that the union is dense and they are basically the image of G1 is included in, uh, in G2 and so on. And then, uh, the, because in the definition, we had to have it finite set here. So that's why you need to do this. And if you basically do this game, now use the fact that, again, this lower, the one below is a price sequence and you can find this gamma two, such as all these triangles commute on Fi's modulo sum epsilon n, such that n goes to, uh, epsilon n goes to zero. And as a result, you'll get a, a result of this uh, commuting diagram, um, you get an isomorphism from D to E. So yeah, the uniqueness is basically a, a very common approximate intertwining argument. So the, the unique uh, limit of a price sequence of all price sequences is called the price limit. And well, just note that if you just gave me an isomorphism, so I have these DIs and EIs, and if you gave me an isomorphism here, so I started, if I started here with an isomorphism, just say theta, then I can just do the same game and uh, find a theta such that extends isomorphism up to any epsilon on a finite set. So this is basically a homogeneity of, of um, the price limit. So you could start uh, from an isomorphism and just extend it. All right. Um, so here's an observation that uh, when I started this, uh, I, I realized that um, the sequence the sequences that Jang and Su build, they're in fact price sequences. Uh, well, because we are talking about the category where objects are PQ with fixed traces, you need to modify their, um, you have to fix these traces. But if you fix the traces properly, uh, then you see that the, um, price, uh, the sequence that they built is a price sequence. So this already, um, was very nice for me because 
uh, you really the 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 fact that uh, um, Jiang Su algebra in order to uh, sorry Jiang and Su in order to show that uh, Z is unique, they use classification results. But that is not necessary because the uniqueness can be proved using the fact that Z is a price element and you don't need any classification results for it. Um, so the, 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 basically the construction that uh, Jiang Yang Su, they have, the, the sequence that they built, first of all, the construction is not canonical. So a priori is not clear at all why such a, a limit has to be unique. And the fact that they use this uh, classification results to show the uniqueness was something that um, I would have liked to avoid. And this was really a nice way to avoid it. You could basically define Z uh, to be the price A limit of uh, this category and the uniqueness follows from the uniqueness of or from back and forth. All right. Um, maybe I shouldn't have included this. Maybe I could have avoided this. But um, yeah, let me, I'm not sure if I'm gonna have enough time. But um, so it, suppose you have a category C and it's a subcategory of K. So you have C and then you have a bigger category K. You say C dominates K if first of all, C is cofinal in K. So if you start with an object A to in K, in the category K, I can find a morphism that goes to C, uh, C is an object of the category C, and it's a K morphism. So from any object, you start from this bigger category, I can find a K morphism going into the object the category, the smaller category C. And the second property is that if I, um, if you give me a morphism from A to B, and I know A is in C, it's in the smaller category, but this could be in K, it's in the bigger category, then I can find two morphisms into object C in the smaller category, uh, let's say alpha and beta, such that this beta is a C morphism. And this diagram commutes uh, up to, again, if you fix a F here and epsilon. I think I've uh, drawn it here better. Um, so basically you can, dominate all the K morphisms when you start from an object in C um, in this way. And now it's not that difficult to show that if you have, again, the same setup, C is a subcategory of K and C dominates K in this sense of the definition, is, which is due to Vyaslav Kubish, um, and if you if your category C has a price uh, price sequence, therefore a price limit, then this price sequence stays a price sequence in the category K. Now the proof of this is uh, maybe I can just. Uh, so what you need to show that is that you have this sequence D1, D2, and so on, Dn, and then you have F here, and you are given gamma, you want to show this absorption property, right, uh, that you can go back. Uh, so you're, you're given, so, uh, you have this arrow from Dn to gamma, and you want to show that you can go back here and this diagram would come uh, commute. And uh, well, that's not difficult if 
um, this sequence, let's say limit is D and this is sequence in, in K, right? Uh, but um, no, sorry, this is a sequence in C, in the smaller category. And C is a subset of K. Um, then you can find this C here, an object in the smaller category, and this map here, let's call it alpha, such that this diagram commutes. And if you just apply this, because C now is in this uh, category C, and you can go back to some PN because this sequence was a price element in category C for some M. You can find it such that this is by an M. And this diagram commutes. And if this diagram commutes, meaning going from here to here to here, is same as going to here. So approximately, so your the, the this map that you wanted is basically this. So you can absorb <clears throat> sequences. Therefore, uh, this is also a price limit. Of, of the category K. So if it was the price limit of this smaller category C uh, and C dominates K, the price limit stays a price limit or it is the unique price limit of the category K. And this is something that I wanted to use because I, um, I, I'm going to have two categories. One is the original category. And then the, I have a bigger category, which is sufficiently close under tensor products. And so I, I this, uh, this uh, proposition basically would allow me to uh, show that, that my price A sequence would stay price A sequence in the bigger category. Um, so here's the idea of the proof of the uh, theorem that I had. Let me remind you what it was. Um, we have this category um, C, and it has a price sequence D and M whose limit is D. So it's a price limit of C. Um, now I would like to built a bigger category, K, such that K is sufficiently closed under sensor products. It's not completely closed, but sufficiently closed. What do I mean by that? Uh, I want, I want these sequences, if I built D1 tensor D1, D2 tensor D2, and so on, where this is five, one, two, tensor five, one, two, uh, such that this, uh, this sequence, whose limit is uh, D tensor D, is a price sequence or is a price limit of K. Now I also want uh, my C to dominate K. Now I had another price sequence, it was in C, it's namely, D1, D2, and so on. This was in C and its limit was D. I know this was a price limit of C. Now, if C dominates K, then by that proposition, I know that this is also a price 
limit of k. So this d all is also uh, phi say limit of k. So now I have two phi say limits of k. Therefore, they have to be isomorphic. Um, unfortunately, this is uh, not going to be this easy. And uh, oh, by the way, this only shows that uh, D is uh, self-absorbing. But in order to show strongly self-absorbing, then I use this homogeneity property that I have. Um, I'll make a comment on that uh, later on if I have time. But uh, that wouldn't be that difficult. So I want this category, larger category K, such that these are objects of my category. And these are also morphisms. Also, I want to have first and second factor embedding, these iota one and iota two in my larger category. So here, uh, I always have the um, first and second factor embeddings. So I want my category K to con uh, contain these two. And I also want to allow the conjugates with unitaries. To be there for you being uh, a unitary in dn tensor dn. But I also don't want to allow a lot of maps because I want to be able to go back here as well um, so, so that I can build these back and forth. So um, it's a little bit tricky, but um, so that was the basic idea. Um, but it turns out that I could not show that um, this is the Fricet limit, this the second one, this D, uh, this D tensor D is a Fricet limit. Uh, but I, what I could show was that, so this is basically what I said, so I can skip this. What I could show is that this second sequence is a weak Fricet sequence. Now, what's a weak Fricet sequence? Suppose again, I have a category K. This D N phi N M, a sequence in K, is called a weak Fricet sequence. If it is again cofinal, so if I start with any element of A, I can go to D N for some N. Now, the second absorption, the absorption property is a little bit different. It's weaker. So before, if you gave me epsilon and a finite set here, subset of some dn, and a map gamma into some object B, uh, this is a gamma, gamma morphism, uh, sorry, K morphism, then I could go back and make this diagram approximately commute. But here, maybe I cannot do that. But what I can do is that I can find M large enough such that if from here you give me a gamma, a K morphism into some object B in the category K, then I can go back and absorb this map. Now, what's the difference? Now, what I'm saying is that this diagram commutes, meaning that from here to here to here is same as going all the way to here. So this is in fact strictly weaker than being a Fricet sequence. There are examples of Fricet, um, uh, Fricet sequences, uh, weak Fricet sequences that are not Fricet sequences. And uh, this relates to, uh, instead of amalgamation property, then you have here weaker and weak amalgamation property. Uh, so if you have A, uh, maybe you cannot, do this, that you can always join the arrows together and get the amalgamation. But if you start from A, then you can find B. Now from here, if you give me two arrows, I can amalgamate in the sense that going from here to here to here is same as going from here to here. So this is called the weak amalgamation property. And it's again, it's, uh, it's weaker than uh, amalgamation property. There are categories that have, um, weak amalgamation property, but they don't have amalgamation properties. They're quite rare though. 
but again, you can show that the weak Fraser sequence of K, weak Fraser sequences of K have isomorphic limits. This is again a uh, approximate intertwining argument. It's a little bit more tricky. Uh, it's just a little bit more uh, um, bookkeeping. Uh, now the unique price, uh, unique limit of weak price sequences is called the weak price limit. So what I could show here was that this is in fact a weak price limit. And this would be also, a price limit is also a weak price limit. Um, therefore, it has to by uniqueness of weak price limit, uh, these two have to be isomorphic. And um, so this said, uh, before going to the proof, um, here I have this, um, um, I, I set my, I want my category K to be sufficiently close under tensor product. Uh, so this is what I mean. I'm not gonna spend uh, much time on this since I'm running out of time. Suppose you have a category C and you can build a larger category K. And I say that K is this tensor expansion of C if um, basically C is a subcategory of K. Uh, if A is an object of K, A tensor K is in K. And if uh, you have an arrow in, in, in C, you have uh, phi, then you also have phi tensor phi in K. So I'm expanding by adding uh, uh, some tensor product. So making it close uh, a little bit at least. Uh, the, the things that basically I need. Um, and also I want, as I mentioned, I want the uh, first and second factor embeddings to be k-morphisms and the conjugations with unitaries to be there. Now, the main theorem is the following. Now I can state it precisely that suppose C is a category of unital separable C star algebra and unital star homomorphisms, and C dominates a tensor expansion of itself. So you have C and you can build a K, which is a tensor expansion of K, but C dominates K. So that the price limits of C stay a price limit in K. Uh, now, if C has a price limit D with approximately inner half flipped and D strongly self absorbing. Now, the, the proof of this is um, again, let's attempt it one more time. So we have D, which is the price sequence of K. Uh, so these are price limit of K of C, sorry. Uh, so I might a smaller category C. Um, because C dominates K, this sequence is also a price sequence of the category K. That was the proposition. Now this sequence, because K is a tensor expansion, is a sequence in K. So this is a sequence in K. Now, I claim that this sequence is a weak price sequence of K. And the proof of this uses the fact that um, the has approximately in a half flip. So I'm gonna skip this uh, and maybe uh, go back to the picture. But anyways, uh, let me just uh, quickly make a comment here. So what we have here, no, sorry, why doesn't this, yeah. Um, in order to show that this sequence, the, uh, this, D tensor D is a price element. And I have this sequence, DN tensor DN um, is a weak price sequence. I have to show that I can find M larger. If you give me epsilon greater than zero and F, 
a finite subset here, I can find dm, tensor dm, for m large enough, so that from here, if you give me gamma, an object B, I can absorb it here. So DK tensor DK such that going from here, 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 the same as going to here on F modulo epsilon. Then I have this the ends and so on, and its limit is D, because this is, these sequences are both weak price sequences, they have to be isomorphic. Now, why, why weak price, not a price? Because I needed this M, and I get it from the fact that um, uh, my uh, D has approximately the inner half flip. Um, so in order to do this, first, fix a finite subset G here, such that uh, G is uh, basically, if you make this G tensor D, which is this uh, sum of the elementary tensor products, like from one to K, then uh, F is up to some epsilon half is included in G tensor G. So I get this finite set G here, and um, I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to stop here. But let me just finish by saying that uh, here, I have my F. Um, no, that's not what I wanted to say. I wanted to talk about this M, that since D has approximately inner half flip, I can find M greater than or equal to N such that I can flip this by M N A tensor one with uh, conjugated with unitary and I'll get to uh, one tensor by N M A module some epsilon. And uh, this U is going to help me to make the diagram commute. Basically, if I start from pi, if I, Go with phi and m here. Now, if you give me gamma here, I can consider this map and take the first factor embedding here. Now, using the fact, now I have this, these two arrows going from here and then here. Uh, and I know that this sequence is a price sequence, so I can absorb it. So I can absorb this arrow into this one because. This sequence was a price sequence. I knew that. Uh, now, a little bit of a technical definition. I can build this map, a theta, and if I take the image of you, you was here, and I got it from approximately inner half flip. Sorry, this. You was here, and uh, using that, I can <clears throat> get you tilde in some DK large enough such that if I go, um, so yeah, if, uh, uh, if I go from here to here, then to here, this was using the eta prime that I had, and then here, and then if I conjugate with this unitary, then that would be same as going from here to here approximately. And that's it. That would show that D is isomorphic to its uh, tensor product with itself. And then I can show that there, it is in fact, uh, using this uh, homogeneity that it is um, strongly self-absorbing, which I'm not going to uh, talk about. Um, so here I had a few more slides talking about the category Z, which is uh, the, the objects are these prime dimension drop algebras. And uh, so this is what they proved. Now the category that contains this tensor product, it's closed sufficiently under tensor product. I'm going to allow these objects to be there and a few maps, exactly the ones that I need to make it a tensor expansion. 
And that's it. You can apply the same theorem and get that Z is strongly self-absorbing. Yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. Sorry, I went over time, but I, I, I was telling David that I asked Braga in the email, how much time do I have? And you never replied to me. And I assumed I have hour and a half. That's why I had too many Oopsies. slides. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm one of the co-hosts. Maybe I could see, see if anybody has a comment or question. Um, yeah, I have a question. Uh, so you, I, I don't know, it's probably a common question, but is there any hope for doing the same thing with C star algebras and more general morphisms? Like not star homomorphisms, but you could take like UCP maps, UCP maps, which decompose mm -hmm. as some kind of um, some zero maps or something like this. Yeah, I think there is, but I, I don't think anybody has done this. Uh, so the notion of price limits or price sequences in C star algebra is something quite new. And mm -hmm. uh, there are only a few papers written about them. Um, we basically know very little which C star algebras are prices. And it's quite tricky. And we, you need to find the right category, right? Like uh, uh, some AF algebras are price limits in a, some nice way, uh, some are not. But I don't think anyone has ever considered um, like classes or categories where the morphisms are uh, order zero or uh, CPC or, um, yeah, as far as I know, no one has done this. Um, all right. Yeah, yeah. Um, other comments or questions? I mean, there are things people do in operator spaces like non commutative Gurari space and things like this that I guess are. A little bit like what Ben is asking about. Um, if you just treated a C star algebras within the category of operator spaces and dealt with C. Yeah, I think Mark so. actually maybe Martino Lupini has this long paper uh, called uh, Price Limits in Functional Analysis Functional Analysis. And he probably considered some CPC maps there. I'm not sure exactly what he proved. I don't remember. Right, but I think the objects were operator systems and not C-star algebras. I mean, I don't know if that gets you a different result. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, yeah, but for, for C-star algebras, I think uh, like there are these uh, questions like is our Kuhn's algebras uh, somehow price limits? Uh, well, uh, first of all, there is it's not clear if there are limits at all, but you might find the right category uh, with the right morphisms so that um, Kuhn's algebras are price limits there. Mm, but I'm not sure. Or other C star algebras. I think uh, what Bichon uh, proved that they, they proved recently with Alessandro Vignati that uh, like W is a uh, price limit. Um, so yeah, the, I don't know if they're more results. Um, yeah, but all the results that I know uh, the morphisms are um, star homomorphisms, they're embedding. Other comments or questions? I have kind of an open ended question that I guess. I will ask. Um, I mean, classically, people do for say limits um, of uh, where the categories are finitely generated, right? You look at the finitely generated substructures or the finite a bunch of finitely generated things, and then you you try to put them together. And in, in, in classical logic, you don't have epsilons mm -hmm. and deltas, and so you just yeah. all, all you're doing, you know, this this kind of point norm convergence you get it on the nose because everything is finitely generated. So it seems like the weakening is 
to do this point norm convergence and then totally forget whether things are finitely generated or not. Who cares whether they're finitely generated anymore? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, um, well, uh, here in this category theoretical approach, uh, really, uh, all the uh, proofs of these uniqueness and uh, homogeneity, they're basically uh, just approximate intertwining arguments. And, um, and you're not um, establishing any correspondence, uh, like in, in, in the classical uh, Freistet theory, you have this correspondence between the ultra homogeneous structures and their ages and so on. Here, um, it's just uh, basically what you need is this commuting diagram. And really, uh, my proof here is uh, I don't consider it to be so much of a Freistet theory. All I need is this absorption property. Uh, for me, just, just somebody told me that this Jiangsu algebra is the algebra that, uh, well, uh, you have this, these commuting diagrams. That's it. I mean, uh, you call it whatever you want. And this is what really uh, matters here. Um, so you don't need so much else from uh, Freistet theory. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, anybody else? Braga, you're controlling the record, but. Yeah, I was going to say that I'm going to stop recording now then.